In Laboratory 8, we're going to be looking at the identification of bacteria through biochemical testing. This is another one of the labs that has a fair number of YouTube videos to view, uh, view regarding procedure today. And of course, you'll be taking the pre-lab quiz at least two hours prior to the beginning of that lab to prepare for the lab. So starting out here, a few general concepts. In the pre three previous labs, we've been using microscopes to observe bacteria. And staining bacteria does give us some information. We can, of course, determine the bacterial morphology, that is its shape or its arrangement, its form, etc. If we do a gram stain, we can determine if it's gram positive or gram negative. And of course, we can stain to observe certain bacterial structures. We did a capsule stain, an endospore stain, and a flagella stain. But beyond that, the microscope's rather limited. Basically, one gram negative bacillus looks pretty much like any other gram negative bacillus under the microscope. So what we rely on largely to identify bacteria still is biochemical testing. And that's based on the concepts that the biochemical reactions an organism undergoes acts as a thumbprint for its identification. And that's based on this chain of logic. We know that different species of bacteria have different molecules of DNA. That is, they have a different series of nucleotide bases along their DNA. And we know the order of nucleotides in DNA determines the order of amino acids in a protein, so DNA codes for protein synthesis. And so if bacteria have unique DNA, they should be able to make some unique proteins. And of course, most enzymes are proteins. Enzymes in turn catalyze chemical reactions. So if a bacterium has unique DNA, it's gonna produce unique enzymes and therefore carry out unique biochemical reactions. So here's where the differential medium that we defined in lab three comes in. We said a differential medium differentiates bacteria according to their biochemical characteristics. It tells us whether or not a particular organism can carry out a particular chemical reaction. So what we do is we look for the end products of that chemical reaction to see if they carry out that particular chemical reaction. And we add indicators typically to the medium that react with the end product of the reaction being tested. And if that reaction occurs, we get a visible color change. So although it sounds complex, biochemical testing to identify bacteria, they're doing all the biochemistry. We're basically inoculating a medium and looking for a color change. And we can compare the results of the biochemical reactions we see on our unknown with that of known biochemical reactions for different microorganisms. So today we're gonna to show you the concept in lab eight of how we can use biochemical testing to identify bacteria. And we'll use a lot of these biochemical tests coming up to identify specific bacteria as the semester progresses. Uh, one final word on our introduction. We can classify enzymes into two broad groups called exoenzymes and endoenzymes. Now, exo refers to outside, so exoenzymes are secreted by bacteria into the surrounding environment, and their job is to break larger nutrients into smaller nutrients that can then be transported by the bacterium across the cytoplasmic membrane. So these are enzymes that work outside of the cell breaking larger nutrient molecules into smaller nutrient molecules that can then enter the bacterium. Now, once the nutrients enter the bacterium, they can be further broken down to obtain energy to drive chemical reactions, or they can be used to form building blocks for synthesizing cellular components. And so uh, the enzymes that work inside the cell are called endoenzymes, endo referring to within. And I mentioned that because the first two parts of today's lab will demonstrate exoenzymes, enzymes working outside of the cell. And again, I've uh, put down the videos here to review if you want to review your aseptic technique since we've been using the microscope for a while here. So the first part of today's lab is starch hydrolysis. 
Hydrolysis, remember from biology, refers to breakdown. It's actually the insertion of water at a bond site to break that bond. And what we're looking at here is the ability of the bacteria to hydrolyze starch. Now starch is a branched polymer of glucose. That is a whole bunch of glucose molecules bonded together with other glucose molecules branching off. And it's a huge molecule. Starch is way too big to go through the cytoplasmic membrane of cells. So if a bacterium or a human cell for that matter is going to, hydro is going to use starch as an energy source, it has to first hydrolyze the starch, break it down into glucose. And so that's done with an enzyme called diastase, an enzyme that splits starch, which we see here, into individual molecules of glucose, which can then enter the cytoplasmic membrane and be utilized by the cell as an energy source. So for this lab, we're working in pairs today. And uh, this, you're gonna take one plate of starch agar. Now, as you see here, starch agar is a clear looking medium, starch is soluble. So we can't see it in the agar, but it is there. And we're gonna use broth cultures of Bacillus subtilis and Escherichia coli. Now we have both of these bacteria growing both in broth cultures for you to use today and on agar plates for you to use today. For the starch agar and the next test, the skim milk agar, you're gonna use broth cultures of Bacillus subtilis and Escherichia coli growing in a liquid. So take your plate of starch agar using a wax marker, draw a line on the bottom of the plate, dividing it in half, label one half Bacillus subtilis, the other half E. coli. And then as we see in figure six, you're gonna streak a single line of E. coli on one half of the plate and a single line of Bacillus subtilis on the other half of the plate. Now again, we're not streaking for isolation or spreading it out here, we want a straight line because we want to be able to observe exoenzymes. You'll then incubate the starch agar plate upside down, stacked in your Petri plate holder at 37 degrees Celsius on, of course, the shelf corresponding to your lab section until next time. Now, next time to find out if the bacteria hydrolyze the starch, we're going to add iodine, which is a starch indicator. Iodine will react with starch and turn a dark brown or blue-black color. So the iodine will tell us whether the starch is still there in the agar or the starch has been hydrolyzed by an exoenzyme of the bacterium. So if the starch has not been hydrolyzed by the bacterium, then the starch remains in the agar. When we add the iodine, the agar will turn dark brown or blue-black. If we look at figure 3b here, we see on this half, this bacterium, the E. coli, did not hydrolyze the starch. The, star the agar turned a dark brown to black color here, indicating the starch is still present to react with the iodine. So this bacterium did not hydrolyze starch. On the other hand, if the bacterium produced an exoenzyme to hydrolyze the starch, we're gonna see a clear zone around the growth where there's no longer any starch present in the agar to react with the iodine so we don't get the change in color. So we see in this figure 3A that the Bacillus subtilis here hydrolyzed the starch. It secreted an exoenzyme that went out into the agar, broke down the starch into glucose, so in these areas, there's no longer any starch left to react with the iodine to turn dark because the bacteria hydrolyze the starch. And remember when you're answering these quiz questions on your next lab quiz, we're looking to see if the bacterium produces an exoenzyme to hydrolyze the starch. I get a lot of people saying that the bacterium was hydrolyzed. Hydro hydrolysis is to break something down. The bacteria not being hydrolyzed they're producing an exoenzyme that hydrolyzes the starch so they can utilize the starch. Part B deals with protein hydrolysis. Now, of course, proteins are made up of amino acids, long chains of amino acids connected by peptide bonds. 
and proteins are too big to go through the cytoplasmic membrane of cells. But bacteria may be able to hydrolyze the proteins into peptides or individual amino acids, and then they can use those amino acids to synthesize their own proteins and other molecules. So in this case, we're looking for the bacteria to produce an enzyme called protease, an enzyme that hydrolyzes proteins. But we're being more specific, it's not any protein. Today, we're gonna to see if the bacteria can hydrolyze the protein casein. Now, casein is the protein that gives milk its white, opaque appearance. So milk looks white and opaque because it contains casein, a protein. So for this, again, in pairs, you're gonna take one plate of skim milk agar, and since it's made with skim milk and milk has casein, the agar appears white and opaque. You're gonna use the same procedure here that you did with the starch agar, except we're using skim milk agar. We're gonna use broth cultures again of Bacillus subtilis and E. coli. So divide the skim milk agar plate in half, label one half Bacillus subtilis, the other half Escherichia coli. Then using your inoculating loop, aseptically streak a single line of Escherichia coli on one half of the plate and a single line of Bacillus subtilis on the other. Again, we're using a single line because we want to look for hydrolysis, in this case, of casein. Once you've inoculated the plate of skim milk agar, incubate it upside down in your Petri plate holder on the correct incubator shelf at 37 degrees Celsius, and that corresponds to your lab section. So again, if the casein is not hydrolyzed by exoenzymes of the bacterium, then the agar will remain looking white and opaque. So we see in figure 1b here that E. coli growing here did not hydrolyze the casein. Uh, casein causes the, the agar to appear white and opaque. The agar still looks white and opaque. But if the bacterium can hydrolyze the casein, then as the casein's broken down, uh, the agar loses its white opaque appearance and we see a clear zone around the bacterial growth, such as we see in figure 1a here. So here we see where the bacillus subtilis secreted an exoenzyme that went out into the agar and hydrolyzed the casein. So again, on this agar, you should be able to tell me whether or not that bacterium hydrolyzed casein. And again, on all of these, make sure you tell me what chemical is being hydrolyzed or fermented or broken down or whatever reaction is occurring, uh, because these are for specific tests. So we don't want to say it was hydrolyzed. If it's skim milk agar, casein was hydrolyzed. If it's starch agar, starch was hydrolyzed. Now, some of the most common tests we use to identify bacteria is to see which carbohydrates they can ferment in order to obtain energy. So remember, carbohydrates often serve as energy sources and they're composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, with the hydrogen and oxygen being in the same ratio as water. So sugars and starches are carbohydrates. Now facultative anaerobes and anaerobic bacteria may be able to ferment carbohydrates. So remember fermentation, as you learned in biology, is an anaerobic breakdown of carbohydrates in order to obtain energy. Now there's many, many different carbohydrates out there in nature and different bacteria are able to ferment different carbohydrates in order to get building blocks and energy. So the way we find out if a particular bacterium can ferment a particular carbohydrate is we look for the common end products of fermentation. And so whenever a bacterium ferments a carbohydrate, we get certain end products, either acid end products alone or acid and gas end products produced. And that depends on the carbohydrate in question and the organism that's carrying out the fermentation. So to test for fermentation end products, we inoculate a tube that contains a single carbohydrate 
Today, we're going to see if they can ferment the sugar lactose using one set of tubes, and we'll see if they can ferment the sugar maltose using another set of tubes. Then we have to have a pH indicator, which today will be phenyl red. Phenyl red is red at a neutral pH, but turns yellow to clear at an acid pH. So that's how we'll detect acid end products from fermentation, which we always get because the acid will lower the pH, turning the phenyl red to a yellow to clear color. To detect gas production, we also add what's called a Durham tube or sometimes gas tube. And this is a small inverted test tube added to the broth. And if gas is produced, the gas goes up the inverted test tube. And as a gas accumulates at the top of the tube, it forces the liquid out, causing a large gas bubble to appear. So there are three possibilities today. The bacteria might ferment that particular carbohydrate, producing acid end products alone, but no gas. The acid will lower the pH, causing the pH indicator phenyl red to change from its original red color to a uh, yellow to clear color at a uh, acid pH, as we see in figure 2a. So this is what the medium looks like before you inoculate it. At a neutral pH, uh, phenyl red is red in color. And so, uh, and, and here we see the Durham tube. It's a little mini test tube that's upside down. So this would be the bottom of the test tube. And if gas is produced, that'll go up the tube and force liquid out. So here's one possibility. This is fermentation with acid, but no gas. We tell it's acid because the phenyl red turned yellow, indicating acid production and acid is an end product of fermentation, but notice there's no bubble at the top of the Durham tube. The Durham tube's still filled with liquid. So that's fermentation with acid and no gas. Another possibility is that the bacteria might ferment the carbohydrate producing acid and gas. So again, the acid causes a pH indicator to change from its original red color to a yellow or clear color at an acid pH. But in this case, gas will also collect in the Durham tube, causing a substantial gas bubble to appear at the top of the Durham tube, as we see in figure 2b. So this would be fermentation with acid and gas. Acid, because the phenyl red has turned yellow, which it does at an acid pH. Gas, because we see here this large gas bubble. And again, this has to be substantial. We're talking about a good quarter of an inch or more of gas at the top of the tube. Little tiny bubbles like we see here, if they're in the top of the tube, wouldn't count. It has to be significant gas for it to be gas production. So this would be fermentation with acid, phenyl red turns yellow, and gas, a large bubble in the tube. And remember when you're interpreting these on a quiz, don't tell me it changed color. Tell me what that color means. If I ask you what we conclude about that back what the bacterium did there and you say it turned yellow, that doesn't have any meaning other than that you can recognize the color yellow, which we assumed was a skill set you had coming in. So we can say that the bacterium fermented uh, the carbohydrate in this particular tube producing acid and gas. Not it turned yellow, but acid was produced. That's what the yellow means. And there's a bubble in the Durham tube, therefore it also produced gas during fermentation. And of course, the third possibility is that the carbohydrate's not fermented, so there's no acid, no gas, and it remains red, as we see in figure 2C here. So that would be no fermentation of the carbohydrate because there is no acid and no gas. So for this, you're going to take three tubes of phenyl red lactose broth and three tubes of phenyl red maltose broth. Now, when you pick up the tubes and put them in your test tube rack today, make sure you label them M or L for maltose or lactose. The uh, test tube racks containing the tubes are labeled, but not the individual tubes. And they both look the same, like in figure 4D here. So as you pick them up, make sure you write an L or an M on the tube so you know which sugar is in that tube. Now we're going to switch to agar plate cultures of Bacillus subtilis 
Escherichia coli, and Staphylococcus aureus. So first again, make sure you label each tube with the name of the sugar in the tube and the initials of the bacterium you're growing. So you know which bacterium is growing in which tube and which tube contains which carbohydrate. So quite simply inoculate one phenyl red lactose broth tube and one phenyl red maltose broth tube with Bacillus subtilis. Then inoculate a second phenyl red lactose broth tube and a second phenyl red maltose broth tube with Escherichia coli. And finally inoculate your third lactose tube and your third maltose tube with Staphylococcus aureus. Incubate the tubes in your test tube bracket 37 degrees on the incubator shelf corresponding to your lab. And next time we'll look at them to see if the carbohydrate was not fermented, uh, no acid, no gas, or it was fermented producing acid and gas, acid phenyl red turns yellow, gas bubble in the durum tube, or if the carbohydrate was fermented producing acid but no gas, phenyl red turns yellow indicating acid but no gas in the durum tube. Now, sometimes you look for unique end products of metabolism as kind of key tests to identify bacteria. And two examples of that are indole production and hydrogen sulfide production. So a few bacteria have an enzyme called tryptophanase that can take the amino acid tryptophan and break it down into molecules of indole, pyruvic acid, and ammonia. Very few bacteria can break down tryptophan into indole, pyruvic acid, and ammonia. And this happens to be one of the key tests for identifying Escherichia coli. <coughs> so to test for this, we take a medium that contains the substrate tryptophan. We inoculate it and incubate it. And next time we add COVAX reagent, which is an indole indicator. If the tryptophan was broken down into indole, pyruvic acid, and ammonia, the indole will react with the COVAX reagent, turning it red, as we see in figure 5a. So the COVAX reagent, when you add it, is yellow in color. And this is a stab tube we're using today. So when we add the COVAX reagent, it will sit on top of the agar. Notice here, this is where the COVAX was added. The COVAX has turned red, indicating indo production. If the COVAX remained yellow, then indo would not have been produced. Now, another unique end product is hydrogen sulfide production. Some bacteria can break down sulfur-containing amino acids or reduce inorganic sulfur compounds into hydrogen sulfide. And this can then be used by the bacterium for different purposes. This happens to be a key test sometimes for proteus and salmonella, the production of hydrogen sulfide. So to test for hydrogen sulfide production, we take a medium that has a sulfur-containing compound and some iron salts. We inoculate it and we incubate it. If the sulfur is reduced to hydrogen sulfide, the hydrogen sulfide reacts with the iron salts in the agar to form ferric sulfide, FES, which is black in color. So quite simply, if hydrogen sulfide is produced like in figure 5b, the agar turns black. If the agar doesn't turn black, then hydrogen sulfide wasn't produced. So notice this bacterium is negative for indole production. The COVAX remains yellow, but positive for hydrogen sulfide production the agar turn black. And both positive and negative tests are significant, so you want to give the results for both tests. If neither hydrogen sulfide nor indole are produced, then the agar remains colorless and the indole, or the COVAX reagent remains yellow. So this bacterium would be negative indole, negative hydrogen sulfide production. There are a few bacteria that are positive for both. You would see the red indole and the black hydrogen sulfide. And the first two we showed you when we were indicating indole would be indole positive, hydrogen sulfide negative. So again, all these tests, you have the videos on how to interpret the results that you looked at. 
So the procedure here, we're using what's called SIM medium, which stands for sulfide indole motility medium, S-I-M. We're not going to use it for motility because we used a better motility medium in lab seven, motility test medium. But we are going to use a SIM medium to determine if the organism produces hydrogen sulfide or not and whether it produces indole or not. And we're going to be inoculating the SIM tubes with agar cultures of Proteus mirabilis, Escherichia coli, and Enterobacter cloacae. Now notice Escherichia coli and Enterobacter cloacae are both EC, so you have to be very careful when you label your tubes. Don't put EC, you have to add a little more than that. And when you're picking up your unknowns, make sure that you're getting E. coli as opposed to E. cloacae. So read carefully. So quite simply, stab one sim medium tube with Proteus mirabilis, stab a second sim medium tube with Escherichia coli, Stab the third sim medium tube with Enterobacter cloacae. Incubate the three tubes in your test tube rack at 37 degrees on the shelf corresponding to your lab section. Next time, we'll add COVAX reagent to detect indole production and look at the agar to detect hydrogen sulfide production. Now, our final biochemical test we're going to do today is catalase activity, and this will be done as a demonstration by your instructor. So catalase is the name of a specific enzyme found in most bacteria. It's also found in plant cells and human cells. Any cell that's capable of aerobic respiration has the enzyme catalase. And catalase is the enzyme that breaks hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, into water. H2O and free oxygen, O2. So during normal aerobic respiration, remember cells have to remove hydrogen ions, the stuff that makes acid acid, uh, so it doesn't accumulate in the cell, and it does this com by combining two protons with an atom of oxygen to produce water as an end product of aerobic respiration. And of course, during that process, energy is given off and stored as ATP. But some cytochromes in the electron transport chain attach two protons to a molecule of oxygen producing toxic hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, instead of water. And since hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, is an oxidizing agent and toxic to the cell, the bacteria or the human cell or the plant cell have to immediately break down that toxic hydrogen peroxide into harmless water and oxygen, and that is why these cells have the enzyme catalase. To break down the toxic hydrogen peroxide generated by the electron transport chain into harmless water and oxygen. So most bacteria uh, that are catalase positive because most bacteria have carry out, are capable of carrying out aerobic respiration. But if a bacterium is an obligate anaerobe, like the genus Clostridium, uh, obligate anaerobes, of course, grow only without oxygen. So they obviously don't use oxygen as an electron acceptor. So they have no need for catalase. And then some bacteria, like the genus Streptococcus and the genus Enterococcus, that we're going to take up in lab 14, get their energy strictly from fermentation. They don't have an electron transport chain, so therefore they don't need oxygen and they don't need catalase. So bacteria that strictly carry out fermentation or carry out uh, anaerobic respiration or, uh, or are obligate anaerobes uh, don't need the enzyme catalase. But any bacterium with, that has aerobic respiration does need catalase. And of course, our cells have catalase, like we said, as do plant cells for the same reason. Now, uh, we're actually going to use the catalase test in several labs coming up uh, when we get into identifying uh, some of the common pathogenic bacteria. We'll be doing gram stains of both Staphylococcus, one of the bacteria we're using in today's lab, and Enterococcus the fecal strep that cause a lot of healthcare associated infections. Now, although the entrococci are cocci in chains, they have a streptococcus arrangement and the genus staphylococcus 
are cocci in irregular grape-like clusters. That's the way they typically appear, staphylococcus arrangement, streptococcus arrangement, when we see them in a liquid. But when they come off a petri plate, both enterococci and staphylococci appear as small irregular clusters, short chains, pairs, singles. And so on a gram stain, when the bacteria come off a petri plate, it's kind of difficult to determine if the arrangement is a streptococcus arrangement that we would see with enterococcus or a staphylococcus arrangement that we'd see with the genus staphylococcus. So we'll actually use the catalase test to help confirm the arrangement in some later labs with the gram stain if it's gram positive. So we'll be using that to differentiate the genus enterococcus from staphylococcus in terms of arrangement. But anyway, today we're going to show you how the test works. So all we need for that is a culture of the bacterium grown on an agar plate, which your instructor will have, and some 3% hydrogen peroxide like you buy in the drugstore. We add a few drops of hydrogen peroxide to the culture. And if the organism is catalase positive, as the hydrogen peroxide is broken down into water and oxygen, the oxygen bubbles through the water, causing a foaming. So if we add hydrogen peroxide and immediately starts foaming, it's catalase positive. If we add the hydrogen peroxide and nothing happens, no foaming, it's catalase negative. So again, that will be demonstrated uh, by your instructor. So that's a little bit about the test today, the concept behind what we're doing, a brief look at the procedure. And of course, you had the video showing you all the results. Don't forget, of course, at the end of the lab, we have our performance objectives. You want to answer those so you can prepare for the lab quiz. And again, they tell you which ones will be practical questions under results. And of course, there's a little self-quiz with answers you can do as always.